Toxic by Mark Franklin. Chapter 8, June 2014, The Boland Fells, Lancashire. Another group of soldiers might have spent the hours of the night in muffled conversation about how cold it was. It wasn't supposed to be cold. This was the desert, after all. Deserts were hot. Everyone knew that. Everyone learned about that in primary school. But these were not another group of soldiers. These were six SAS soldiers, and the SAS soldiers knew what deserts were really like. Bloody hot in the day, bloody cold in the night. More to the point, they knew all about being bloody cold. They had learnt how to deal with being bloody cold on the Brecon Beacons, and if they hadn't been able to learn to deal with how to be bloody cold, they would have returned to their units. It was their fifth night of being bloody cold. It had been bloody cold from the minute the low-flying Chinook had dropped to the desert floor to unload one Land Rover and six guys. They had driven for a while and reached their scheduled laying-up point. It was a dried-up riverbed which was perfect for hiding a Land Rover and watching the highway that connected the reserve bases of the Iraqi Republican Guard with the front lines. A few hours earlier, when the desert had been hot, like deserts were supposed to be hot, they had received a flash radio message. Operation Desert Storm was up and running. The curtain had been raised. He was on lookout. The two till six shift, looking out into a dead world of inky blackness and silence and nothingness. And he was bloody cold. Time? 0420. A hundred minutes to go before he could crawl into his sleeping bag and crash. Not so long. And within a few hours he would be bloody hot again and the empty world around him would be blindingly bright. A hint of a sound, and then a larger sound. A small disturbance in the night air. Was it really there? Yes, it was really there. It was definitely really there. Time to pass the word. He gently shook the shoulder of his sleeping sergeant who woke up quietly. Wakey, wakey, boss. We've got engine noise. And they had. After twenty minutes, their night vision showed them a green world where ten trucks were picking their way along the empty highway. And then the ten trucks stopped and shadowy figures jumped down and lined up to piss at the roadside and smoke their cigarettes. Thirty seconds on the radio. A whispered death sentence. And six minutes later, the air all around them screamed with the howling roar of jet engines. And the ten trucks lit up into a world of screaming, burning pain. The six men of the SAS jumped on board their Land Rover and bounced over the rocky ground to the place where fire had come down from the sky. There were men on fire, running here, running there, their arms thrashing like demented windmills. Others writhed on the floor, burning, screaming, screaming like no men had ever screamed before. Let's finish this up. Four words. Words of cold execution. The six men of the SAS got down from their Land Rover. The six men of the SAS snapped off the safety catches on their weapons. The six men of the SAS walked calmly in the night. The six men of the SAS dispatched the burning, writhing figures on the floor with calmly placed shots. Pop, 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 pop. Such a quiet sound, really. Such a trivial sound. Such an unlikely sound to herald so many dead. And there was a strong odour in the air. Burning fuel and burning flesh. A smell to go with the sound. And every sound and every smell burrowed into the brains of the six men of the SAS. Poisonous little worms. And once they were securely embedded, they would never come out again. Never. 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 The sound of burning flesh. The smell of burning flesh. Pop, 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 pop. In the night. In the silence. His eyes snapped open. It had been what he had come to know as nightmare number two. The Iraq nightmare. Outside the moor was quiet tonight. Very still. Bathed in the cold light of a benign moon. 
He got up from his drenched sheets, he pulled on shorts and t-shirt and running shoes. He went downstairs to his bare kitchen, he took a long drink of clear, cold water. Tonight he had no need of a head torch, tonight the light of the moon would be quite enough. And it was enough as he ran and ran, but he didn't try to bother to outrun the smell of burning flesh and the sound of burning flesh. To try to do that was pointless. Major General Robert Jordan took two whole days thinking about what he was going to do. The first decision which needed to be taken was whether or not he was actually going to do anything at all. This was the big one. Massive. He had no doubt that the information Chad had left in his care was as poisonous as poisonous could get. It was toxic. And when a thing was as toxic as this thing was, it could kill off a career just as surely as getting caught by the tabloid press smoking crystal meth with a $20 hooker in a Detroit motel. Robert Jordan liked his career. He was proud of his career. And he harboured fierce ambitions for his career to go a whole lot further in the years to come. He was in his prime, and he'd been told time and time again that he was on all the right radars. He knew that an airy corner office in the Pentagon was already in waiting. He also knew that he could just as easily choose to switch over to politics, where he would be welcomed with open arms by either side. Congressman Robert Jordan of Nebraska. Senator Robert Jordan of Nebraska. Either option sure kind of had a nice ring. But there was no doubt that poking his nose into a 33-year-old black op, which was buried halfway to the centre of the earth, would do nothing for his chances. The smart play was easy enough to identify. The smart play was to walk away and never, ever look back. But this wasn't an easy option for Robert Jordan to take. To walk away would mean walking away from doing his best to save the United States military from its biggest body blow since being run out of Saigon with its multi-billion dollar tail between its legs. In the end he realised he just couldn't do that. A career was one thing but a life lived out with that kind of stain on his conscience was another thing altogether. In the end he took a long hard look at himself in the mirror and decided that once the dust settled He was first and foremost a man of the 101st. He was a screaming eagle. He had sworn never to flinch when his rendezvous with destiny duly arrived. The guys who parachuted into Normandy on the night before D-Day hadn't flinched. The guys who'd dug in and seen off the German panzers in the Ardennes hadn't flinched. Chad and his guys hadn't flinched when they waded through blood to reach the top of Hamburger Hill. And he wasn't about to flinch either. Ah, screw that. Once he had decided he was going to do something, he was faced with the next decision. What, in the name of hell, was he actually going to do? He headed out into the heavily wooded hills that looked down on the camp and gave his two Alsatians the best walk they'd enjoyed in months. The thing was to make sure he stayed rooted in crisp, clear, scientific logic. There was no point in expending any more mental energy on seeking alternative solutions. Chad was on the money as usual. There was only one reasonably viable solution. Get a no vote. He allowed himself a wry smile. He had spent some time watching the coverage of the referendum campaign on the online Brit news channels. A few days earlier... There'd been some small shitstorm when Barack Obama had given a guarded nod to a continued union. Robert had felt it seemed uncomfortably like the pot calling the kettle black after all. Didn't all Americans celebrating getting out from under London rule every 4th of July? So why shouldn't it be okay for Scotland to do the same? Robert knew why, of course. As usual, it was all down to the nukes. Where would they go? Would they go anywhere? Would Uncle Sam have to free up a corner of the Norfolk naval base for the Brits to park up their subs? No wonder the President preferred the option that would give him the easiest life. Would it be possible to engineer a no vote? Well, sure. Yeah, it was possible. The United States had been successfully getting the governments of its choice into power for decades. Italy, Greece, Indonesia, just about every country in Latin America. And most of the time it had worked out pretty well. Other times they'd back complete assholes like Diem or Noriega or Samosa, 
And then it hadn't worked out so good, but that wasn't the point. The point was that they knew how to swing a result. The point was that most of the time they managed it without driving any of their Abrams tanks down the road to the presidential palace. They did it from the shadows. They spread the cash around. They got rid of bad guys and gave the supposed good guys a leg up. So, a no vote in Scotland? Sure. Why not? Only a lousy five million people. Should be a walk in the park. That was not the question. The question was who would get the job done. This was obvious CIA territory, but these days the CIA was a very different animal. Getting something like this signed off by Langley would be much the same as turning around a super tanker. There would be no chance in hell of the kind of quick decision that would be needed if they were going to get the thing done before September the 18th. The White House? Oh, forget that. John Kerry was no Al Haig. Chuck Hagel? Yeah, sure, Chuck Hagel was good people. Robert had met him plenty of times and they were both Nebraskans, but would Chuck sign off on this kind of thing? On his own? No chance. NSA? Same story. For the best part of ten miles he became increasingly convinced that the task was hopeless. And then he remembered Reuben Westlake. And once he thought about Westlake he knew that the answer to the who question had been pretty damned obvious all along. He had first met Westlake in 2005, when the 101st had been deployed in Iraq's Al-Anbar province. That day, Reuben Westlake had been shown into Robert's office wearing jeans, t-shirt and a Pittsburgh Steelers cap. He had been gym fit and as smooth as a $5,000 an hour corporate lawyer. He had pulled paperwork from a calfskin carry case and tossed it onto the desk with a smile. Robert had read the letters which had come from men who occupied corner offices in the Pentagon and the White House. The content of the letters was much the same. Reuben is our guy. We would like you to assist Reuben in any way he asks you to assist. And, oh, one last thing. Don't write anything down in the official log about Reuben. This letter doesn't exist. Reuben Westlake doesn't exist. Nothing exists. You just do like he asks and forget about it all. So, you're one of those. Westgate grinned. I guess I am. The man in the Steelers hat pulled a phone from the back pocket of his jeans and dialed up a number. I'm with him now, sir. He passed the phone to Robert. The voice at the other end of the line was unmistakable, and it belonged to a four-star general who was sitting in his office in the Pentagon. Hi there, Bob. Westgate is on the level I can sign off on now. Duly signed off he was. The 101st were not required to do a great deal. On three occasions, Westlake turned up out of the blue with a map in his designer case. On three occasions, he required the 101st to seal off an area in three different towns. Once the area was locked down, free passage was duly given to two SUV vehicles, each of which contained four passengers. On three occasions, there was the sound of explosions and small arms fire. And on three occasions, the same SUV vehicles exited the secured area and duly disappeared into the ether. On those three occasions, well-known leaders of Sunni militia groups were hastened on their way to paradise by persons unknown. It was put down to local rivalries, turf wars, local differences wild men in a wild country. If the 101st had picked up any of these guys, they would have been expected to follow due process, arrest them and process them down the line. It had seemed like someone somewhere had grown tired of due process. Someone somewhere had decided to give the job to Westlake. Just whack the assholes, Reuben. End of story. Robert hadn't liked it much, but he hadn't lost any sleep either. The targets were not nice guys. They probably had it coming. Sure, America was supposed to be better than that, but war was war. A few months later, Robert had been summoned to the Green Zone in Baghdad for two days' worth of meetings. He was headed for the gym when a voice called him. Yo, Bob! Westlake. Westlake in a rather ridiculous safari suit 
Westlake, who was somewhat less smooth than usual. Westlake, who had the eyes of a man who'd been drinking all day, maybe even all week. By a drink trooper? They had gone to Westlake's room, and he had duly cracked open a bottle of twenty-year-old malt. For a while they talked football and Pittsburgh and Omaha. They were two American guys who were far from home. Westlake clearly had stuff he wanted to get off his chest, and Robert was intrigued to hear what it was. After three hours they were into their second bottle, and Westlake was starting to fade. Robert decided that the time was right. So, who do you work for, Reuben? This brought on a laugh which soon dissolved into a hard cough. It took Westlake a moment to recover his breath and light up yet another lucky strike. You probably wouldn't believe me if I told you. Ah, try me. Okay, then I work for a hedge fund, Bob. Schulman and Sprake. We got real nice offices just off of Wall Street. I hate to think what the rent must be. Genuine top-end real estate. A hedge fund? Sure, why not? We make money growing trees, Bob. The money comes winging in and we have a bunch of magician guys who do their thing. Ah, you know, send the motherfucker to Grand Cayman, send the motherfucker to Luxembourg, Jersey, London, Frankfurt. Hell, Bob, we just send that motherfucker here, there, and goddamned everywhere. We send it so far and wide that no son of a bitch on God's green earth is ever going to follow it. So what on earth are you doing here? Yeah, well, that'd be telling, wouldn't it? He bit down a huge swallow of scotch and winced at its heat. But fuck it. I manage the situation, Robert. I'm Uncle Sam's project delivery guy. You see, Bob, you have old ways and you have new ways. Things change and move on and then things go right back to where they started. You're a Nebraska guy, right? 150 years ago, you guys had a way of taking care of the bad guys. You came up with a nice chunk of dough, you printed off a bunch of posters, wanted, dead or alive. And then it was open season for any cracker in the state to go try and get lucky. Well, things changed, right? We got state police, we got FBI and lawyers and judges and all kinds of shit. Due process, right? It was the same when we did our war fighting. We identified some... Gestapo gad guy living it up in his chateau with a nice piece of French ass. We'd send in a team of rangers and they would all make like John Wayne, right? What goes around comes around. Soldiers like you worrying about health and safety and abiding by the law and compensation when you get busted up and mentally fried. You all become a real pain in the ass, Bob. Too much aggravation. So Uncle Sam, he decided to go back to the old ways. That's all. Robert was sobering up in a hurry. So, where do you come into this picture, Reuben? I never noticed you with a sheriff badge and a Winchester rifle. Westlake chuckled. No, sir, not me. I ain't never whacked nobody. Like I said, I'm a fixer. I do the deals. Deals? Shit, Bob, you're like some kind of dripping fucking tap. Enough already. Jeez. It's all fine, you want to know how we roll, Mr. Rabborn Soldier. Well, strap yourself in, buddy. Welcome to Uncle Sam's craziest theme park. So, here's how we got started. Somebody picked up Shulman and Sprake and installed a few guys. They chose me as the boss, which was pretty cool. They gave me the contact details for three of the big cartels down in Mexico, and they arranged for me to go visit with them. I offered them a real sweetheart deal. The kind of deal no son of a bitch south of El Paso was ever going to say no to. So, send the old drug baron. Here's the thing. Here are the account details for Shulman's Sprake of New York City. Every year, you deposit 100 million and you leave it sitting for 12 months. After 12 months, you get to draw out 60 million. That's a 40% laundering fee, which is kind of steep but it also buys you a free pass. It's like a membership fee for the country club. So long as the guys stick to their hundred mil a year, the DAA and the FBI will look the other way. It's an import duty with a difference. So, I hire some real smart guys, I give them 300 million to play with, and they make an average return of 30, 43%. That's a cool 130 million a year to go with the 120 million laundering charges. 
knock off 20 mil for overhead. And Uncle Sam has a nice 230 mil war chest for Black Ops. You got me so far? Jordan was. Okay, so that was part one. Part two, that's even easier. I got in touch with a few companies in the private sector. Yeah, there's plenty to choose from, Bob. Plenty. They go by all kinds of corporate names, and they have fancy offices in London and New York and Moscow, but they're still just a bunch of old-fashioned mercenaries. They suck in all kinds of special forces types who are sick of getting paid peanuts for putting their asses on the line of fire. I checked them over, audited them, then I put together a list of preferred suppliers. I got ten of them now. And here's where we pretty well go back to the olden days. I get the word to some bad guy hanging out someplace who Uncle Sam don't run around anymore. I send out the details to my preferred suppliers and I ask him to tender for the contract of whacking the dude. It's all pretty corporate. Sealed tender document, closing date, payment schedules, completion bonuses. There are lawyers all over this thing. Whoever bids the lowest quote gets the gig. They whack the guy. They bring me proof of kill and I transfer the funds. It's as easy as that, Bob. There ain't no due process. No human resources. No breeding. Hard shit in the Washington Post. And best of all, all the bills get paid by a bunch of drug-dealing assholes from Mexico. And you? Me? I get a big fat bonus every year. And I live like a goddamn king. We gonna made a market out of charging bad guys the cost of whacking other bad guys. So welcome to the new Wild West, Bob. Westlake had passed out a few minutes later, and Jordan had eased him into the recovery position and left the room. Had he been surprised? Maybe, maybe not. Only a blind man could have spent the time he'd spent in Iraq and Afghanistan and not seen there was a whole bunch of dark stuff going down. From the minute the planes had thumped into the Twin Towers, the cowboys had been given a free rein. Not that Reuben Westlake was any kind of cowboy. He was pure hustler. How much was he making for his project management? Millions for sure. What an upside-down, crazy, stupid world. The next morning he woke with a thumping head and a lousy taste in his mouth. He vowed to clear all thoughts of Reuben Westlake from his brain forever. He headed back to the bandit country of Al Anbar province and all of a sudden everything seemed clean. Nine years had passed since he had shared that whiskey fueled night in the green zone with Reuben Westlake. Did Shulman and Sprake still exist? Did Reuben Westlake still exist? There's only one way to find that out. When he got back to his quarters, he logged online and booked a ticket to LaGuardia for the next morning. Toxic Chapter 9 Magdalen College, Cambridge, June 2014 Every day, Sir Nigel Telford would make two forays from his rooms in Magdalen's first court. At 8 a.m., a porter would knock his door and help him to negotiate the stairs. He would then slowly make his way round a 400-yard circuit, which would take him through Benson Court and out into the gardens by the river, and then back again. He would then head inside for two poached eggs on toast in the company of the undergraduates. At 7 p.m., the porter would once again help him down the stairs. This time, Nigel would be wearing his threadbare gown, and he would take up his accustomed place at the top table in the formal hall for dinner. It had become a very rare thing for him to venture out into the world beyond the porter's lodge. But routines are there to be broken, and Cathy King had changed the tempo of his days. No longer was life simply about counting down the days to his appointment at the checkout counter. Cathy King had presented him with a final task, and so it was that instead of returning to his room after his poached eggs, he climbed into a waiting taxi instead. It took twenty minutes to cover the handful of miles to the village of Granchester. It had been three years since he had last visited the only friend he had left who was older than he was. It was a friendship that, against all sensible odds, had now lasted for over seventy years. When they had first met, Nigel had been nineteen years old. Marek Kaufman had been 23. 
They had met in the forested mountain range that separated Czechoslovakia from the German Reich. Nigel had been parachuted into the forest to open up a line of communication with the partisans. Marek was a Jewish student who had escaped Prague before the Nazis had the chance to send him into the ghetto. For two years they had blown up train tracks and supply convoys until Marek's luck had finally run out late in 1944. He was captured and sent to the Theresienstadt concentration camp. But, as things turned out, he still had just about enough luck left in the tank. The Red Army arrived to liberate Theresienstadt a matter of hours before Marek was due to be transferred to Auschwitz. When Nigel found him, he had weighed less than seven stone. It took many months for Nigel to secure Marek his British citizenship. But finally, on a bone-cold February morning in 1946, the two men had disembarked the Dover ferry. For the next 40 years, they had continued to fight at each other's shoulder, this time from Century House. Marek retired to his cottage in Grantchester in 1986. When Nigel finally followed suit a decade later, the two men would meet twice a week to play chess and remember the old times. But slowly but surely, old bones made it harder and harder for either man to leave their comfort zones. The chess games became monthly affairs, then bi-monthly affairs, then maybe once a year. The door to the cottage opened when Sir Nigel was still halfway along the path, and Marek beamed with delight at the salt. Hurry up, you old bugger. At this rate, I will be standing here at Christmas. Look at you, you're like an old man. You've got a nerve calling me slow. I seem to recall watching you move like a drugged-up hedgehog that day the Germans caught you. They pulled each other's ancient legs all the way into a cluttered kitchen. A table covered with ghastly lino of the 1970s had a chessboard all set up and ready. Am I making coffee or are we drinking whiskey today? I think whiskey. You think you can get me drunk enough to lose? Stranger things have happened. Sir Nigel smiled at the thought. The two men had been playing chess for seven decades and never once had he come close to winning. He wasn't a bad chess player, in fact he was pretty good, but Marek Kaufman was a quite brilliant chess player. Glasses of whiskey were poured and the battle commenced. Not that it was much of a battle. They went through familiar motions and just like always the Czech prevailed with ease. I would like to run something by you please, Marek. Of course, run away. Sir Nigel laid out the facts Cathy King had unearthed and his old friend quietly absorbed them. The Englishman had a brain that could see chess moves four or five moves ahead. The Czech could quite happily look three or four games ahead. He'd always been able to see things that Sir Nigel could never have spotted. So, I expect you know why they sent their man to Fastlane? asked Marek. I think so. They were neurotic, scared. They saw a KGB man in every cupboard. They were still convinced we were all Moscow's secret pals. They must have decided to do something. Marek smiled. At which point you hit a big high brick wall and decided to come running to Marek to have your hand held. Well, I wouldn't go that far, but of course I would welcome your input. Of course you would. You always do. More whiskey? Yes, yeah, just a small one. Kaufman picked up a conquered pawn and tapped it gently against the cracked linoleum. I don't think this is very good, do you? Sir Nigel shook his head. No, not very good at all. You must consider one thing above all others. This was Americans, and our American friends are never subtle in their approach. They are not like us. We are devious and crafty. We sneak about in the night. We pick locks. We lay our little traps. We work with smoke and mirrors. We play our nasty little games. But America is such a very young country. They are like a big enthusiastic puppy dog. They will always use a sledgehammer to crack nuts, yes? Why? Because they can. They just love to deploy maximum power. Hiroshima, the B-52 strikes on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, shotgun ore in Iraq, they never change. Whenever they are in any doubt, they will choose the option of carpet bombing. You agree? Sir Nigel nodded. Marek continued. So, 
We think we understand exactly why they are so worried about fast lane in 1981. They foresaw a far left government in London who would dance to Moscow's tune. They did. And they must have been absolutely terrified at the prospect of the very same far left government allowing their Soviet scientists to crawl all over their Polaris missiles. Indeed. And to combat this threat, they sent in one man. They didn't talk to us or apply any pressure. They didn't insist on our own people joining in with base security. No, none of the above. They said nothing, and they sent in one man. One of their very best. A Delta Force soldier. Not a spy. A soldier. Why a soldier and not a spy? Because Special Forces soldiers are stronger than spies. Stronger? Yes, stronger, and I mean physically stronger, not necessarily mentally stronger. I think Chad Forrester was chosen partly for his physical strength. Why? I think they required Chad Forrester to carry something that was quite heavy, something that would be difficult to manage for anyone but the very strongest of men. Something like what, Merrick? Kaufman shrugged. This is just supposition, of course, but we must remember how the Americans will always choose the sledgehammer to crack the nut. The Polaris missiles were the nut in this case. The sledgehammer? Well, if there is no Polaris missile to inspect, then the Soviet scientists would never have the chance to inspect them. So how do you make sure there are no Polaris missiles to inspect? What do you do, Nigel? You blow them up. Yes, you blow them up. And when they have been blown up, the whole area will be an irradiated wasteland. No evidence of anything left whatsoever. Lots of keep out signs. And of course, a horrified world will put the whole thing down as the most terrible accident. CND would have an absolute field day. Telford ran bony fingers through dry, wispy hair. And the best way to blow up a nuclear bomb is to use a nuclear bomb. Indeed, it is maybe one of those small tactical nuclear bombs that could be fitted into the size of a suitcase. What was it we used to call them? Wasn't it suitcase bombs? Oh, good Lord. And how easy it would have been for them to achieve. They had free access to come and go as they pleased. We'd have never searched an American vehicle. Of course we wouldn't. And then, all they would have needed was a strong man who knew how to move about without being seen. A man like Chad Forrester. There was no need to say any more. The game was finished. The glasses of whiskey were finished. They were both suddenly very tired. Please, Paul, if there is anything else I can do. Yes, of course, Merrick, of course I will, and, and thank you. Telford walked away, very slowly down the path to the waiting taxi. Most of Giles Penworthy's colleagues would have been less than amused to receive a summons to an audience with Sir Nigel Telford in his rooms in Cambridge. Of course, the man was a living legend, and of course he'd done more than his bit, but really, the man was 91 years old, for goodness sake, a fossil, a relic. But Giles Penworthy wasn't like most of his colleagues. He joined the Secret Intelligence Service in 1975, when they had still been in Sentry House. Telford had been both his role model and his boss. Those had been the days when the service had picked away at the loose strings of an increasingly threadbare Soviet empire. Leipzig and Magdeburg and Prague and Bruno and Jena. Covert meetings and bundles of cash for resistance groups. Giles had been in the field and Sir Nigel had run things from his office in London. And they had won. They had won hands down, and Giles would never forget the reason for their victory. People. Brave people. People who believed. People who were well trained and motivated. People who went out and gathered other people about them. Domino people. More and more and more, until every Monday night saw thousands of people take to the streets in Leipzig to say enough was enough. 
There were no computers or drone strikes or digital surveillance, only people. And of course they had been on the right side. There had been no question about that. The men in the Kremlin were bad men, corrupt old men hanging onto their datchers and their Zill limousines and their treasure troves of foreign currency. Everything changed in the 1990s. Sir Nigel retired to Cambridge to gather dust, and the service swapped its venerable home in Century House for a brash wedding cake monstrosity on the banks of the Thames. Slowly but surely, people mattered less and less. The new breed were quite convinced that there was a digital solution to every problem, every threat. They were convinced that they could gather in enough data, then their supercomputers would do the rest. It was utter nonsense, of course, and Giles had watched each and every failure from the front row of the auditorium. He never made it anywhere close to the top floor, but he'd never been scrapped either. He was still there, senior and barely noticed. He would take the train up to Cambridge three or four times a year to spend time with his old boss. The visits left him feeling melancholy and nostalgic, but Sir Nigel would always find a way to help him to find the motivation to carry on. He never mentioned these forays to his colleagues. His Cambridge days were always on his own time. Of course, the service would be well enough aware of his trips, but the data would probably be lost amidst the vast blizzard of data which hardly ever told anyone anything at all. But this time things were different. This time he had been summoned, summoned as a matter of urgency by a handwritten note delivered early in the morning to his home address by a motorbike courier. The note hadn't said anything about not mentioning his trip to anyone in the office. It hadn't needed to. If Sir Nigel had wanted the office to know, then he would have made a telephone call to the office. A motorbike courier felt like the old days. When in doubt, use a person, leave as few footprints as possible. So, the old bastard had found a last gasp of life. The idea put a rare smile onto the tired old face of Giles Penworthy. It was late morning by the time Giles climbed the creaking stairs and tapped at the door. Ah, Giles, marvellous, what an absolutely splendid chap you are. Come on, come on, come on in, let's clear some space. This is Cathy, by the way. Cathy is my secret marvel. I'm afraid that she fell for the charms of a sweet-talking emissary from Thames House, but we must forgive her for that, Giles. We must prove ourselves to be the bigger men. But fear not, Cathy is now seconded to me, and so we are all friends here. You will have tea, of course. Giles reached over a heap of cluttered and shook hands with the young woman who gave him a bemused sort of a smile. How old was she? Twenty-two? Twenty-three? How very strange. And all the while, Telford kept up his welcoming chatter. Tremendously good of you to come along at such short notice. Damned encouraging, in fact, for an old bird like me. Cathy, you really should be aware that you're in company of one of the very greats. I used to call Giles my Leipzig ghost, you know. Giles sat and smiled patiently. Had Sir Nigel ever been given the chance, he could have talked the KGB into surrender single-handed. Once the pleasantries were over, the three of them sat facing each other over their cups of tea. So, Cathy, over to you. Please could you put Giles into our picture? Take the time. There's no hurry. She took just over an hour, enough to churn Giles's already pale face almost translucent. Who else knows about this? Only one, Marrick. It was Marrick who suspected the suitcase bomb. Penworthy was completely lost for anything to say. Telford gave him an understanding sort of a smile. Rather ticklish, isn't it? Just a bit. Bloody hell, Nigel, this is a complete nightmare. It is indeed, and when something is a complete nightmare, the very best thing to do is to break it down into bite-sized pieces. So, here goes. All the evidence suggests that the gallant Chad made his recent trip to Scotland entirely under his own steam. There's no reason to expect he was anything other than a lone wolf. The Americans would hardly find it difficult to check on a location of their little secret. They still have their people in and out of half fast lane on a regular basis. It would be completely straightforward to get a man in to have a look. 
and what they would certainly not do is to bring in the man who planted the bomb who has just come out of retirement and send him flagrantly to a lay-by where no stopping was allowed. Are we agreed? Yes. Had they sent any other man on planet Earth, Cathy would have had no trail to follow. So, there we are. Chad sees something on the news about the referendum and he gets himself into an absolute tizzy. What he doesn't do is call into the offices of whoever tasked him with the mission in the first place. Now, we think this is very important. If the original operation had been official, then Chad would have known there would have been records and files somewhere. Official records would have meant he could have surely followed official channels instead of flying all the way from Missouri to Glasgow. So, I think we can assume that Chad is pretty well convinced there will be not so much as an official trace of whatever he did in 1981. Chad is certain that he carried out what our Americans' friends like to call a black op. A very secret black op, which very, very few people knew about. Where are these people now? It was 33 years ago. The kind of men who sign off on this kind of thing tend to be in their twilight years. What if the men who sent Chad to Fastlane were all 60 years old back in 1981? They're probably all dead now, and Chad must feel very alone. Why else would he do what he did? Giles nodded. I'll buy that. What on earth are we supposed to do about any of it? Of course, that's the tricky part. Very tricky indeed. All we have is a collection of compelling, but essentially weak, circumstantial evidence of a thing that may or may not have happened. We have our suspicions. No more, no less. It is more than likely that the only person in the world who knows what really happened is Chad himself. This, of course, means that even if we manage to convince those who are higher up the food chain than ourselves that there is something evil and wicked hidden away in Fast Lane, what can anyone do? The Prime Minister is hardly going to pick up the phone to the White House and start making all sorts of wild allegations. No, said Penworthy, he certainly won't be doing that. What we need to do is to establish now is exactly what Chad has done having completed his little one-man mission. Has he merely gone back home to his corn farm, having made a vow to keep his dark secret safe forever and ever? I don't think so. I think I have a feel for Chad Forrester. Marek thought he was chosen for his physical strength, and I have no doubt that he was, but I believe he was also chosen for his fervour. Chad Forrester is a man who loves his country. They are very good at producing such men over there in America. Just look at him in the old photographs. He is an old-fashioned patriot. He is a man who would go that extra mile for his beloved country. Telford paused for a moment and sipped at his lukewarm tea. But, of course, that is the 1981 Chad. We have a glimpse of a different Chad now. A Chad who sought some sort of solace in the peace camp. A Chad who with age has lost some of his old certainty, and now he has a choice to make. He can keep his secret and put his country at risk of an appalling scandal. We should take some time out to imagine just how dreadful a scenario that would be. Scotland becomes an independent sovereign country, the missiles are all sent away, workmen embark on the task of converting the base, they find a suitcase bomb which is very quickly identified as being from America. Would the new Scottish government keep such a thing secret? Of course they wouldn't. Such a discovery would justify their stance against the monstrosity of nuclear weapons. They would shout it from the rooftops, and there would be a diplomatic crisis the likes of which we haven't seen since Suez. Chad will know this, and I cannot believe that Chad will be willing to see America face such a calamity which means that he'll need to find someone to tell. Quite right, Giles. That is exactly what he will do. And of course it is very important that we know who he tells, and who they tell. For only then will we be able to try and guess just what on earth the Americans are about to do. What can they do? We think they have three options. Number one, detonate the bomb. 
Such a solution really doesn't bear thinking about, and I very much doubt if anyone will think about it. In fact, I very much doubt if anyone still has the wherewithal to make the wretched thing go bang. Number two, they send in another chat to smuggle the device out, and that, of course, will be the best thing for everyone. I'm afraid I have little optimism that such a solution will be possible. I think Chad came to Scotland to see if salvaging the device was possible. If that had been the case, I very much doubt he'd have been found in the peace camp in such a sombre mood. And option three? Yes, option three. This is the one we feel is most likely. Option three is that in some way, shape or form, the United States of America tries to influence the democratic process and engineer a no vote in September. Now Giles slumped back in his chair. Would you mind awfully if I smoked? No, not in the least. Giles lit up and took a couple of heavy draws. They have plenty of previous, don't they? Oh, but don't they just lots and lots of previous? What do you want me to do, Nigel? I'm rather hoping that you still maintain that very useful link with those private investigator pals of yours in Brooklyn. I do. Why? I think it'd be a very good thing if they worked their magic and took a look at what Chad did when he arrived back home. Where did he go? Who did he see? Penworthy nodded. And who did he tell? Absolutely. Who did he tell is the very most important thing. And if we can find out who he told, we might also be able to find out who they told. And we work our way up the chain. Oh yes. We do.